Leviathan Wakes, Book One in the Expanse, uh, written by James S. A. Corey, which is a collaboration between Ty Franck and Daniel Abraham. And you know I'm a big fan of Daniel Abraham. I actually didn't know. However, Ty Franck was also an assistant to George R. R. Martin. So both gentlemen have worked very closely with George. You know I'm a huge fan of that. And I think that they've taken a lot of uh, cues from him, but have really just become their own masters of writing and have just such a distinct way of telling their stories. Daniel Abraham has been uh, highly regarded on this channel for his Dagger and Coin series. And uh, he actually has a new series coming out in 2021, but that doesn't matter because today we're here to talk about sci-fi and we're here to talk about The Expanse. And to give you an idea of my history with The Expanse, I actually got on board with the TV show uh, way back in the day when it first got announced on Sci-Fi. It was a part of their rebranding and I knew that it sounded good and I thought they were going to put the budget in to make it special. And it turns out out of all those pilot shows that they tried out at that time where they launched this show, this is the one that stuck. And I am so glad it did. It's been one of my favorite TV shows in the past 10 years and I'll be honest, I think The Expanse is probably in my top 10, maybe even top 5 shows of all time. I am ashamed to say yes, I am all caught up on the show, but I had not started the books. I actually started the audiobook for Leviathan Wakes back when season one was out, but I had a lot of other things going on and I wasn't doing my due diligence as a book nerd. Uh, but I decided over the last few months to listen to the audiobook and read some pages when I could, but mostly audiobook this uh, while I worked out. And it's been a long time coming, but I am so glad that I've concluded it and it's given me a new appreciation for the story here of The Expanse. And I do want to also remark before I jump into the content, the audiobook for this is fantastic and I would not at all, you know, bat my eye at doing a full audio listen along with this. It was fantastic. Probably over 75 to 80% of the book has been for me experienced through audio and I don't regret it at all. So very rarely with sci-fi do we see the in-between of the absolute end game of scientific expansion in the universe where we're already hopping galaxies and such or to, you know, where we get first contact or things like that. This kind of encompasses all of those things that we love about sci-fi. And all of the sci-fi that has been considered great and epic and been the ones that stick in our minds and to, to see success are the ones that take these big, species-defining moments where we, we leap into the next, the next portion of our existence in the galaxy and the known universe and still are able to make it feel human. I love how the solar system looks at the beginning of the expanse. We have the belters, which are the laborers. They feel like they're being used by Mars and Earth and corporations, which they absolutely are, but they have their own you know, accents and they have belter language and they're very skinny from the gravity. I mean, the science here feels so grounded in what we know in physics today that uh, as a physics nerd, this gets me immediately sucked in. And we're terraforming Mars, which you know, maybe Elon's gonna do here soon, who knows. Uh, so that also feels very real and military, you know, is the main driving force of Mars, it seems. And then you have Earth, which is kind of like, you know, good old classic power and, and a lot of rich people and then a lot of devastation as well because Earth has been, you know, just absolutely drained of resources and the economy is not great. The middle class is completely gone. There's the very rich and then there's the very poor. And the way that that kind of gets relayed through some of the characters' backstories and stuff is really, really cool here in book one. I know it gets a little bit more in depth in later books, but I thought for our first entry here, they did a great job of setting the scene of our, of our solar system. And I'm just gonna say it. Uh, I think this is one of the best book ones I've ever read. Uh, you know, I think of a Game of Thrones, uh, other amazing books like Eye of the World, and I would put Leviathan Wakes up there. With introducing a series and uh, setting the stage, uh, for lack of a better term, I just think that this knocked it out of the park. And if you haven't read or watched show or anything, you're watching this for the first time and you've seen this thrown around, I just wanted to start off by saying this doesn't just start out as, it's a space opera that is disguised with like a detective noir, like just like a tr almost like a true crime uh, police investigation that then becomes so much more. And I've noticed when I have actually recommended the TV show to people, they say, you know, they're halfway through season one. I'm like, what in the world? I thought this was a space epic. And I'm like, just trust me here. You'll see. And it's the exact same thing you're here in book one. And I love how the story escalates and there's building blocks. There's things going on behind the scenes that then come to fruition and to the front. And it's just very well unraveled to the reader. And it wouldn't be a space epic if there wasn't some resemblance of a crew, right? And the crew dynamic at its basis, right? It has to be a group of people with a common goal or at least in a common setting 
that want to do it or accomplish something or find something or go on a journey. And they have roles to play. Like you got the tough mechanic here. You got the hacker per se. You got the, you know, the slick pilot that might have had former military creds. And then you have the captain. And all of those things are extraordinarily important in the crew. What takes a crew to the next level, like we've seen in Star Trek and other things like that, is the fact that the crew then has to be more nuanced. We have to have great characterization and not just role players per se. I don't think we get all of the nuances here in book one, but knowing that this is you know a longer series, uh, I'm willing to give a pass to not every character being fleshed out. And you can kind of get small hints that they will be later, but the ones that are, and they're more well-rounded here in book one, are just absolutely tremendous. I love it. Like for instance, Holden <laughs> growing up on a commune farm where he has eight people's DNA to you know have produced him and to have birthed him and it seems like it's for a tax break not only gives holden one of the most interesting backstories i've ever heard in any sort of character in any type of fiction but also gives us a very real uh view into what earth's economy looks like if people are having to do these type of things just to get tax breaks to make it and to be self-sufficient on their own farm it just paints a really good picture of who holden is and why he thinks certain ways, but also gives us like the economic status of Earth. And I think that's like one of the very finer pieces of the writing and some of the small things that these two do super well that you're not going to see in a lot of other series. And really at the heart of the story, I think that's what I love most is the writing. I think the writing is so good. Uh, again, I have not read any of Ty Franck's other work, but I have read Daniel Abraham, so I knew my expectations would be high. But this is even better writing-wise than uh, the Dagger and the Coin series by far, in my opinion. And I was pretty high on that to begin with. Like, I'm going to read this line real quick off my phone because I saved it because I just thought it was amazing. And again, this goes into, like, getting characters beyond just roles, right? And we have Miller, who's our detective, trying to solve, you know, Julie Miles' case. And uh, Miller is my favorite character in this book one, by the way. I just want to get that out there. He's one of probably, if I made a top ten characters list, uh, fantasy or otherwise, sci-fi, it doesn't matter. I think Miller would probably be in my top 10. So this is a portion of the right. It's just a one line, but this line provides a, so much just backdrop to Miller's character and gives him characterization that some people would do very long paragraphs for, but this is just a one-liner. And maybe I'm overthinking it, but it says, Miller always had a smile like he had heard a joke at a funeral. Most of us have been to funerals. I've been told jokes. I've laughed at a funeral. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like that's such a relatable line. And it just gives us everything we need to know about the demeanor of Miller with one sentence. To me, those are the little like tweaks and, and lines that really take a novel from like good to great. And the characters, like I said, are phenomenal, but it's also the way they interact. You know, Naomi obviously giving uh, Jim Holden the question that he needs to get by. And then the way that their romance kind of develops in the story is really cool. Um, and then just the crew interactions are great. And you know, Holden... Holden and Miller are so polar opposite when it comes to like what they think is just, but they're both so set in their ways and they're always feeling like they are correct that they're a lot more alike than they seem, even though they constantly butt heads. And I think we've all met somebody, usually it's somebody in your family who you're a lot alike, but just have different ideas of how the world works. And you get to see that here in the way that it's portrayed on paper. And then also to mention the TV show, it's, it's very well done in both. And one of the cooler things in this is that, like, who is the antagonist? Like, we meet some bad guys, but we don't get, like, the forefront boogeyman, per se, in, like, human form in front of you that you're fighting against. It, it almost feels like the bickering and the internal conflicts between Mars, the belt, and Earth in itself, that conflict is the antagonist. And it's just different and again you know i'm used to seeing you know hey here's the bad guy and i love that and that's great but it's cool to see a story that drives forward the plot and the characters without having a big bad evil person saying these lines interact with them and and whatever else i would love to hear your take on who the antagonist is after you have finished leviathan wakes uh, i know the stuff that happens later on because of the tv show but like here in book one there just isn't a super evident main antagonist and usually that would be like a knock but it kind of just works and i kind of already said it's it's very well grounded in science and physics which i really appreciate but it's also grounded and like i said this is what makes great sci-fi great is the fact that it also feels very grounded in humanity there's a lot of emotions and decisions that you can kind of relate back to our world and where we're at and 
in our society and also with our technological booms. And it, you get more of that here. And it makes you wonder, you know, th this feels like a pretty realistic scenario uh, for better or for worse. And who knows, maybe one time we'll look back and say, man, Daniel Abraham and Ty Franck, you know, J James S.A. Corey was calling the shots. They knew the future. And another line that I love from Miller is that we're still really just curious monkeys. And I don't know if there's ever been anything truer spoken in sci-fi. So absolutely love all the characters. I love the writing. Uh, I love the setting. It's good old fashioned solar system here. You know, it's the Milky Way galaxy, which is cool. I'm pretty familiar with that. And this feels like something that is obviously going to build into something better and better. I'm excited to see how the books differ from the shows. Don't tell me that in the comments, please. I know I've seen the TV show, but I don't want any spoilers. I know there's some character changes and other stuff happening. Um, this is not a series where I feel, unfortunately, because I've watched the TV show, I don't feel gun ho to jump into book two like right now, but I am going to read this entire series and it'll probably be mostly on audio over time. Like I said, I've been listening to this audiobook for months when I could, flipping some pages when I had time. But uh, I will definitely be continuing The Expanse. I think Leviathan Wakes is just an absolute stellar hit. I mean, it is, it is as good as it gets for a book one. And I feel fairly confident saying if you don't enjoy Leviathan Wakes, you probably don't need to stay in for book two, three, four, five, just based on what I know from people who have read the books and then also knowing what happens in the show. Um, I think the setup here is uh, just outstanding outstanding i know some people might not feel that way maybe some people didn't like the detective noir stuff or or whatever but i did huge hit with me characters were amazing the writing is fantastic it's to the point um it's curt and it's just like right in between where you get enough description and enough action to, to kind of keep you going so i'll be continuing on with the crew when i find some time and uh, are you going to be starting The Expanse? Have you already started it? Uh, do you love the TV show? If you haven't checked out the TV show, if you need to be sold on the books first, maybe just watch season one or a couple episodes. I'm telling you, what a show and even, you know, just as good books. This is one of those series where I'll be honest with you, uh, just based on what I have in book ones, it don't come from my head. And I know this is like heresy being a booktuber, but... Uh, when I relate book one to season one, I mean, I feel like it's very close. I don't necessarily think one is better than the other. I think they are both uh, masterpieces in their own realm, right? In, in film and then obviously in writing. So uh, you're not going to go wrong doing either one. I'm going to do both because I love this story. And I can already tell when the show finishes up next year, when the final season's out, I'm going to miss these characters so much. And I'm so glad that we have the pages that we do in these books to go back and to visit with them because I do think that this crew is my favorite crew I've ever experienced in sci-fi, whether it be show, uh, movie, or books. And that's saying a lot because uh, I've been pretty attached to some sci-fi. So um, if you like this video, go ahead and hit a like and subscribe. If you want to see more Expanse content, uh, it will be here on the channel in the future and I'd love to have you. Um, thank you so much. And until I see you next time, be good and be healthy. And remember to always keep turning the page.